Hi, my name is Robert Mudengi. I'm a corporate sales trainer. I've been in sales for a little over seven years now. I'm 24 years old today. I've worked with all the major players in the industry. You name them, anything from Rogers to Bell to Lift Clean to National Home Services. I've been everywhere. I've made myself close to a million dollars in commissions over the course of my career. Now you might be asking yourself, what does it really take to make a million dollars in this business? And today, I'm going to explain it to you. But first, I want to start off by congratulating you on the journey that you just began. It's not going to be an easy one. I can tell you that right now. There's going to be a lot of roadblocks, a learning curve. It's going to take a lot of practice before getting to perfection. But if you stick with it, if you put in the time and the effort necessary to succeed, you will absolutely, undoubtedly get there. What does it take to make it in this business, a lot of people ask. How does a 24-year-old black kid, originally from a small country named Rwanda, who grew up in Alexandria, Virginia, with no special education but his high school education, due to the fact that he dropped out of a second year university, can make himself close to a million dollars over the course of his career? Well, very simply, I'll explain it to you. What we do is not a job. It's a lifestyle. Because there are two types of people in this world. There are people who talk about what they're going to do, and there are people who step up to the plate and do what they say they're going to do. If you're watching this DVD right now, I want to welcome you to the Doers Club. You have decided to take a step forward towards enhancing your career as well as your skills as a salesperson. It takes three things to make it in this business. As a matter of fact, those three things can be applied to any area of your life, and you will undoubtedly see the change that you're looking for. Step number one, have a clear and concise vision of what you want. What are you after? A lot of people out there live their life dormant. What do I mean by that? You have no clear and concise vision of what you're going after. So therefore, you fall for anything. Two, have a plan on how to get where you want to get. Because think about it this way. Have you been running east chasing a sunset? Do you want to be successful but have no models? How do you intend to get there if you don't have a map? Make yourself a map, and everything else will work itself out. Three, and that's the most important, resolve your own internal conflicts. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll give you an example. Very simply put, you want to make a million dollars you want to build a billion dollar industry, but you want to sleep in until 12 o'clock in the afternoon. That's a conflict. You want the perfect relationship, whether it be with your boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, yet you want to be right all the time. That's a conflict. Once those conflicts are resolved, and you have that clear and concise image of what you want, and you have that plan on how to get there, then everything works itself out. Welcome to the Doers Club. One of my favorite sayings in the world is a Latin saying that says, Victoria amate curum, meaning victory loves preparation. Before heading out there, before speaking to your first client, make sure that you are prepared. Are you in uniform? Is your shirt tucked in? Is your badge visible? Is your binder organized in a way that will facilitate the sales process for you? Because first impressions are everything. The client has no idea of who your company is, or who carrier is, or what type of furnace that you're offering. All they see is you, and all they buy is you. And if you're coming off a sloppy and unprepared, they will assume that not only your product is sloppy and unprepared, but also your company is sloppy and unprepared. Another very important part of the preparation process is recognizing the demographic of the area in which you're working. See, when people are looking to buy a home, they usually look in places or neighborhoods that has inhabitants that actually meets their demographic. Meaning, if a younger family is looking for a home, they would tend to look for a home somewhere that is populated by younger families, generally. 
because why? They're looking for schools, they're looking for all the little perks that a younger family would enjoy. So once you recognize the demographic of the people with which you're working, then you can cater your process and the self-process itself to the people that you are actually speaking to. When on the street, don't waste time. There's no reason why you should be standing on the corner, smoking cigarettes, looking around. Because believe it or not, the homeowners in that area are looking at you. They see you walking up and down the street. So their impression of you, before you even get there, is already set in their mind. That's why it's very important to make sure that once you're in the neighborhood, you are as professional as you can possibly be. Reason being, if your clients see you wandering on the street without purpose, then they would assume that you're just a charlatan on the street peddling door to door. Professionalism is key. Walk with purpose. What do I mean by that? Don't have a nonchalant walk when walking down the street. You are a professional. Professionals don't waste time. That's why it's very, very key that when you're walking from one door to the next, you keep a rather fast pace because it looks like you're busy, that you have a lot of people to talk to, you have no time to waste, and therefore, you are deserving of the attention that those homeowners should be giving you. What makes a good door pitch? It's one of the most reoccurring questions that I get all the time from the people that I train. What's going to make my pitch perfect? Understand one thing, first of all. You are showing up at someone's door who five minutes ago had no idea of who you are, right? For all you know, you could have showed up at the door and five minutes before his wife could have called him and told him that she was leaving him for a younger guy and you're showing up knocking the door asking him about his furnace or air conditioner. How do you think his reaction is going to be? So first of all, understand there is no magical pitch. There is no magic line, no magic phrases that you're going to say out there that are going to make every single customer click and purchase your product. The secret is in the numbers. What we do is a numbers game. Your pitch could be perfect, but if you only talk to four or five people during the day, understand that the perfection of your pitch is not going to help you much. So the secret lies in the numbers. Talk to as many people as you possibly can during the day, and everything else will work itself out. However, it is important to have a good door pitch that is organized. Because for one, it saves you a lot of time. Two, it eliminates customers that don't qualify for your service. And three, you come off as a professional because you're confident in what you're saying. It's nothing really too, too important. Uh, what's going on right now is, as you're aware, the province is going green. Right. Uh, so they went ahead and upgraded all the efficiency standards and all heating and cooling equipment. Yeah. Uh, my job is very simple. I just have to quickly make sure that you guys are abiding by the new standards in place. Uh, if you guys have to par remove you off the list, nobody bugs you about this again. Uh, and if not, I just have a few bit of information to leave behind mm -hmm. with you. I can take off my shoes for you right there. A good pitch consists of three parts. Who am I? Why am I there? What's next? If anything that you're saying does not fit within those three categories, you're talking too much. And the worst thing that you can do at a door is talk too much. Because all you have is those initial 10 seconds. If you don't create the relationship within those 10 seconds, you might as well walk out to the next door because that one is done for. Now, very simply, who am I? My name is so-and-so. I'm from Constant Home Comfort. Why I'm there? There was a change in government efficiency standards as of last year. I'm here to make sure that you guys are abiding by the new standards in place. What's next? I just need to take a quick look at your EnerGuide sticker, make sure that you guys are abiding by the new standards in place, and I'm quickly out of your hair. Shoes on or off? That is the most important part of the entire pitch. Do not assume that the customer is going to invite you in on their own free will. It doesn't work like that. You have to ask. You have to assume. When a lot of people ask me, hey, Robert, what's your pitch? 
I just shuffle my feet. Assuming the sale is everything. You come off as confident, you come off as professional, and you come off as if you've been doing this for a very long time and you deal with clients on a daily basis, which very soon will be the fact. Remember, who am I, why I'm there, and what's next? One of the door, before I even start pitching, before I get into what I'm here for or what my service is about, the first thing that I do is I gauge interest. Why is it that this homeowner should listen to you? Why is it that they would have to pay attention to you? Well, the way I go about it, there's one system that never fails, the Jones effect. My name is Robert. I'm actually with Constant Home Comfort. How are you doing, uh, Robert? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, you probably had had a chance to speak to some of your neighbors on the street. They probably told you about what we're in the area, or I haven't had a chance yet. People like to do what other people are doing. That's why first thing first, before I even got into my pitch, the first thing that I asked the homeowner was, "Have you had a chance to speak to some of your neighbors? Have they told you about why we're on the street?" Because right then and there, the homeowner now has a reason why they should pay attention to what you have to say. Because the neighbors, those people that fit their demographic, those people that share their needs, gave you the time of day to listen to you. Therefore, they felt obligated to do the same exact thing. There are two types of objection that you run into at the door and inside the home. The first type of objection that you run into, it's called a stall or a smoke screen. This is an objection that the client gives you just to make you go away. Because understand one thing, door-to-door -door sales has been around for hundreds of years. And like anything that's been around for a long time, it is subject to evolution. So over time, customers have learned that there is a group of few key phrases that they can use to make people like you or me go away. Now, the key here when answering an objection is figuring out if this is really a real objection, so that means an actual concern, or is it a stall or a smokescreen? Why is it crucial to make the difference? Very simply put, if you answer a stall, you are answering a lie. If you answer a lie, the customer is going to feel the need to generate more lies in order to make you go away. So how do you make up if this is a real objection or this is a stall? There is an actual systematic approach that you can take that will guarantee that you overcome each and every single objection that you're given and you can find yourself closing anywhere between 50 to 60% more business than you have up to this day. Step number one when answering an objection, always agree first. The number one rule of retail is the customer is always right. Never get confrontational with a client, especially if you're standing on their property, because you will lose. So the key in agreeing with the customer is understanding that by you doing that, you are gaining their confidence. Because people only buy from people they like. And people like people who understand them and how they feel. So for example, a customer tells me, hey man, I need to speak to my wife. I don't think I'm ready to go ahead and move ahead with this process right away. Step one, always agree first. You know what, Mr. Customer? I completely understand. I'm in a relationship myself, and I don't make any decision without speaking to my significant other. Right then and there, it puts me and my client in the same exact bracket, because him and I, or her and I, have the same exact needs because we are in a situation that is very similar, meaning, him and I, or her and I, are both in a relationship, and we have people to answer to. At that point, you guys are now the same. You guys are now friends. Therefore, you can move ahead. 
Step number two when overcoming an objection is to make up if this is a real objection or if it is a stall. Again, you never want to answer a stall because it's a lie. Because if the customer is telling you a lie in order for you to go away and you try to overcome that lie, they'll feel the need to lie some more. So how do you make up if it's a real objection if it's a stall? Very simply, you question the objection. Again, a customer says, I need to speak to my significant other before moving ahead. I should really talk to my wife first. Oh, absolutely. You have a missus, obviously, that mm. you, you know, you want to make sure that she's okay with everything, yeah, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what, man? I've been in a relationship myself for the last mm. six years. I don't do anything without talking to my girlfriend either, okay? Because you know what they say, right? Happy wife, happy home, right? Yeah. <laughs> happy wife, happy home. <laughs> but let me ask you something, boss, really quickly. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, okay? You speak to the missus, and she's like, you know what, honey? This is the best promotion that we could possibly go with, okay? Is this something that you yourself will go ahead with today? I would, yeah. If the client says anything other than yes, that means his wife is not really the concern. The real concern could be anything like maybe he doesn't have the money to go ahead and pay for the service that you're offering. But understand one thing. You just met this person five minutes ago, maybe 15, maybe 20, no more than a half hour, and you've convinced them to let you into their home. That means a part of them has a certain level of respect for you. How often do you feel comfortable telling someone that you have respect for they're in a tough economical situation. That's why it's very important to make sure that you don't answer a stall because you're generating more lies from the client. But let's assume that the customer says yes. You know what, sir? If my wife says it's okay with everything, I'll go ahead and move ahead with this today. Now, your job is to let them know of what you've done for other clients in his position. So Adam said the same exact thing. He's like, you know what, man? I'm not comfortable moving ahead with this before I speak to my wife, Jocelyn. Okay? Uh, so what I did for him, actually, uh, he was actually happy to find out that I could leave uh, my cell phone number on top of the technician's worksheet. Uh, so when Jocelyn got home, she was able to call me and, you know, I was able to explain to her exactly everything that we had done that day. Do you think the missus would appreciate me leaving my cell phone number on top of the technician's worksheet? Oh, you can leave your number with us, sir. If the client says yes to my cell phone number on top of the technician's worksheet, what they're really saying yes to is absolutely everything. They're saying yes to the install. They're saying yes to the money. And they're saying yes to my company and my service. When answering an objection, one of my favorite methods is the feel, felt, found method, meaning I understand how you feel. A lot of your neighbors have felt the same exact way, but this is what they found. The Jones effect will take you a lot of places. Because when a client throws you an objection, all they're saying is, I just want to feel like I'm not the only one doing this. And if you can show them that they're not the only one in the situation that they're mentioning, that there are plenty of others who've been where they stand today, they will absolutely move ahead that same exact day. The fourth step of the process is the most important step of them all. It's called transitioning. When a customer throws you an objection, that means you are no longer in control of the process. When you lose control, everything comes to a scratching halt. The only way to regain control is to get back in a position where you're the one asking the questions. Transitioning is key because it allows you to regain that control. What transitioning means, it means answering the objection, getting the answer that you're looking for from the client, and then completely and utterly changing the subject from the objection itself to something absolutely and completely non-related. In the example, when the client tells me, 
hey, I think my wife would appreciate your software on top of the technician's worksheet. My next question was to ask them, when was the last time that the windows were replaced? That means that him and I now have a gentleman's agreement that this objection won't be coming up again. Control is absolutely crucial. One of the mind tricks that I use on myself is as soon as I walk into a home, in my mind, the last mortgage bills came to my mailbox, and I paid it. That means for the next 45 minutes to an hour, this is my house, and my say shall be law. Some of the most common objections that you will run into selling heating and cooling equipment door to door are things like, I don't want to rent my equipment, or we're okay with our current provider. Again, all the customer needs is the reassurance that they're not the only one making this decision. So if a customer asks me, hey, are you my current provider? I've seen the example when a client asked me from Remembrage. The key here is to make sure that you are as honest as one can possibly be. There is no point in lying to the client because eventually they will find out the truth. And not only you lose their business, but 90% of the clients that find out that they can't trust you tend to go ahead and speak to the remainder of their neighbors on the street about the fact that they may have signed with you as well and you end up losing that business as well. Honesty is everything. Be as honest, be as truthful as one can possibly be. Newer agents or newer people to the industry or reputable people to the industry tend to have the tendency of wanting to write the coattails of the current provider. Don't do it. Make sure that you emphasize on the separation between you and their gas company as well as their current provider if they don't have your service. Because if there is room for any confusion, and if those questions are not answered in a clear and thorough manner, once you're gone, that client is going to start asking themselves those questions. And once they find the right answers, they will assume that you lied to them. Even if you did not do it intentionally. Even if maybe you try to walk around it. Be as clear and concise as possible as to the separation between us or you and their current provider and their gas company. Building rapport with the customer is everything. They have no idea, again, of what your company is. They don't know if it's a great company. They don't know even if your service that you're selling them is a legitimate service. The only thing or the only person that they know is you, meaning they'll buy you. So it's very, very, very crucial to make sure that you're creating a relationship with the client because people only buy from people they like. If the customer doesn't like you, it doesn't matter if you tell them that their brand new air conditioner is going to print out $20,000 every single morning and unmark $20 bills, they still won't buy because they don't trust you. So it's very, very key to build rapport. As you will notice in the DVD, first thing that I did as soon as I walked in, I congratulated the customer on a beautiful home that they have. It's very, very, very key that as soon as you walk into the home, you look around you to find things on which you can build rapport. My advice to you, if you don't know anything about football, don't talk about football. Talk about things that you know. Talk about things that you, the both of you guys, can be able to relate on and build a relationship upon. In the example here, the customer told me that he had a 10-year-old son, and I was very quickly to the point by letting him know that I have a 10-year-old nephew. That created a relationship between myself and the customer because we had that one thing in common.
the qualifying portion of the sales process is the most crucial, yet the most neglected piece out of the whole entire puzzle. Unexperienced agents tend to jump directly into the selling part without qualifying first. The reason why it's very important to qualify your customer before moving ahead and starting selling is because then and only then you give them a reason as to why they should listen to you. We could sit here for 25 minutes trying to qualify you for this equipment, but come to find out at the end that you don't qualify. Uh, only 45% of your neighbors that I spoke to actually qualify for the free equipment here. Wow. Yeah. How is that? How, How can, can I qualify? The qualifying process is broken in three portions. Portion number one, create a need. Is there a need for your product before you start selling? Does the client have any reason as to why they should even contemplate moving ahead with your product or service? First thing that I did, as you noticed in the example, so I've been in the street here for the last two hours, right, speaking to a few of your neighbors. And uh, the main reason that they told me that they never went ahead and upgraded to something more energy efficient is because of the money. Would you say the same thing, the same thing for you guys? Yeah, in the similar boat. If the customer says yes, then the need is present. It's your job to make sure that you find them the best possible solution, both economically sound and product-wise, in order to be able to answer that need. You will notice that once the need is created, the customer now starts paying a lot more attention to what you have to say because they feel like they need your product. The second portion of the qualifying process is offering the client a hypothetical solution to the problem at hand. The emphasis here is on hypothetical. Because if you move ahead and you assume right away that the client is going to move ahead, you're moving too fast. If you move too fast, the client feels again like they're put against a wall. And they have no choice but to get defensive by telling you that they want to think about it or they want to take their time because they're not interested. So the key is to emphasize on the part that this is purely hypothetical. Hypothetically speaking, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen, right? But let's just say that I could wave a magic wand here, all right? If I could have someone come here, take out that old piece of equipment, all right? Put in a brand new one without taking a single dollar in your pocket. How would that make you feel? The key here is once the customer says yes, it would be awesome, is to bring up the fact that they probably think that there is a catch. Oh, it made me feel good. But it would be awesome, but you're probably wondering what's the catch, yeah. right? Who's this guy going around giving free furnaces, right? Yeah. <laughs> the reason why it's key for you to bring it up is because it comes off as though you deal with this type of issues every day. As you noticed, I asked the client, hey, you're probably wondering what's the catch. You're probably wondering, is this guy the furnace fairy going around giving out free furnaces? The reason why, again, it's key for you to bring up the catch portion before the customer does is because you come off as honest, you come off as professional, and you come off as though you deal with this type of things each and every single day on the job. The third portion of the qualifying process is what's called the takeaway. People only love things that they feel like they can't have or they had to work for. If I handed you this DVD right now, and I was like, hey, you know what? Here is a free DVD. Go ahead and take it home with you. If that DVD was to fall in a puddle, you would think about it twice before you dove in that puddle and went for it. But if I charge you $5,000 per DVD, if that DVD was to fall in a puddle, you're diving right after it. Is the same exact thing. Have the customer chase you for what you have to offer. The way I did that is I mentioned to the customer that only 40% of the neighbors that I spoke to 
qualified for the free equipment. That creates a sense of scarcity to what you have to offer. It adds a certain value to your product and service because it's not available to each and every single one who wishes to have it. As you notice in the example, the client followed up by asking me, what does it take to qualify? At that time, after the customer asked me what it takes to qualify, then and only then do I start selling. Before that, notice there's not a single word about the furnace or the, any other piece of equipment that might need replacing was mentioned before the customer asked me what it takes for him or her to acquire my service and my product. So there are three steps of qualification here, okay? Uh, step one, uh, high five, you actually already passed it. Your equipment is old enough, right? The high five is the most important portion of that part of the process. Why? Because it creates a certain affinity between you and your client. There is now some body contact. There is now a little humor. Now people are a lot more at ease. Now that friendship is solidified. The second step to the process is my first initial close. Uh, step two, uh, we have to make sure that you absolutely cooperate with our installers on the day of install. Okay, what do you mean by that? Though? Well, this is the thing, right? We have 19 appointments on the street here, for example, on Wednesday, right? My guys are here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The only way that we can afford to pay for your installation is if we take the money that we should be paying this guy for traveling. Let's say, for example, if he has an install here and he has another one in Oshawa and another one in Orangeville, right? Mm -hmm. Every time that this guy has to get in his truck and travel, we have to pay him, right? So instead of paying him to travel, we'll rather go ahead and put the money towards your install. So my guys are here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, I'm pretty sure I cannot get you Wednesday, okay? I have, like I said, I have 19 appointments on the street and I'm pretty sure that day is right. fully booked. Again, it goes to show that your service and product is in high demand. Hence why you cannot get them Wednesday because Wednesday is fully and utterly booked. But uh, if I could pull some strings and get you Thursday, uh, would you rather have them here in the morning or the afternoon? The last part is the most important of that second step. You really don't care if the technicians are there in the morning or the afternoon. But the fact that the customer just chose a time frame means that they're saying yes to everything before you even start selling. The third step of qualification has one objective and one objective only. Buy yourself some time. As you'll notice, I told the client that the third step of qualification is we have to establish that the equipment can pay for itself and the only way to do it is through a consumption analysis that will be done once we're upstairs. It's very, very, very key that you buy yourself time because the client now understands that this is no longer a two minute process. That in order for him to qualify, in order for him to get your equipment, he's gonna have to put the time aside in order to go through the process. Customer involvement is one of the most crucial pieces of the sales process. Reason being is that it makes the customer feel like they had to work in order to acquire a service or product. All right, boss, I'm going to put you to work here. So if you don't mind just holding the measuring tape there up there for me, please. Okay, 78 inches, perfect. Although I could have very easily done it myself, but the fact that they had to step up to the plate help me with my measuring tape, makes them feel like they had to work for it. Therefore, they will value your service or product a lot more than you just telling them that they qualified and all they have to do is sign a piece of paper. Another example that you will notice of customer involvement was the fact that I asked the customer to input the numbers for me in the calculator. Reason why I did that, again, is to make the client feel like they're part of the process, that they had something to do with their brand new equipment besides signing a check or making monthly payments. So make sure that whenever you're with a client, you involve them in the process as much as you possibly can. Even if it's simple things like filling up the agreement, 
in putting numbers in a calculator, helping you out with your measuring tape. Whatever it is, make sure that there is at least three occasions during the sales process where you require the customer's involvement. Closing is utterly everything in this business that we're in. If you can't close, if you can't get a signature on the dotted line, then you will starve. And that's the harsh reality of things. But the biggest mistake made by most inexperienced agents is they assume that closing happens at the end of the sales process when they ask for that signature. Nothing could be further from the truth. Closing is the perpetual and always happening process. What do I mean by that? You will notice in the example that before I even began selling, I asked the client which day or which time frame they felt comfortable with in terms of my technicians coming in for the job. Do I care? which day the installer is going in? Not in particular. But the fact that the customer agreed to a tentative date, that means they're agreeing to the whole entire process. That means they're saying yes to the furnace, they're saying yes to my technicians, and they're saying yes to the price of it before they even know what the actual price of the equipment is. It's very key because the more the customer gets in the habit of saying yes to you all throughout the sales process, the least resistance they will offer you once you ask for that signature. Another example of a small close that I used was when I asked the client which door they felt comfortable with my technicians coming in from. Notice that you don't really care which door the technicians come in from. But if the client chooses a door, that means they're saying yes to absolutely everything that you have to offer. One of the key clauses that you will see in the example is when the client told me that they needed time to think about it. Again, like any objection or any concern, I was not rattled. I understood that this was part of the process. I understood that this could happen. The clause that I used to go over what he had to think about is called the Benjamin Franklin clause. Very simply put, when a client says that they need to think about it, just like any other objection, you agree with them first. Then what I offered him to do was to go over the pros and the cons of moving ahead with the process. This close works 90% of the time. I need to think about it is one of the biggest objections that you will run into that will stop you from closing right then and there. By applying the Benjamin Franklin close, you will find yourself absolutely and utterly closing 10 times more business than you have to this day. Ninety percent of communication amongst human beings is metaverbal. That means what you say compares very little to how you say it. Ninety percent of everything you say, you say it with your body. So it's very important that you mind your body language both at the door and inside the home. Because remember, sales is a transfer of emotions. So if you're standing in front of the client and he seems like your shoulders are crouched down, he seems like your posture is not up to par, that shows a lack of confidence in what you're doing. It shows a lack of confidence in you as a salesperson. Therefore, if you have no confidence in yourself in what you have to say, the customer has no reason to be confident in what you have to say. Body language is key, again, because it establishes a certain level of trust. For example, you'll notice that when the client opened the door in the example, first thing I did is I kind of put my hands up and explained to him that I was not selling anything. Understand the little things that your body does. Things like breaking eye contact way before you have to. If you are the door, never, never, ever break eye contact. Because eye contact 
shows, again, that you're confident in what you sound. Things like smiling. If you're not into smiling, the company will be more than happy to provide you with some sort of lubricant like Vaseline to apply on your teeth if necessary. Because smiling is a sign of peace. If you can't smile, find yourself another job. Humor and the use of humor in what we do, it's practically everything. If you're not the type of person who's into smiling, laughing, making other people laugh, then find yourself another profession because sales is definitely not for you. Humor is absolutely key. Why? Because it allows to take away from the tension of two strangers in a home. Understand that by being in that person's home and the fact that they don't know you, they have their reservations. Simple joking around, simple making the customer smile will take away from that tension. The use of humor will literally triple the amount of business that you're closing. Because again, it allows the customer to feel comfortable with you. And if they feel comfortable with you, they feel comfortable with your service and they feel comfortable with your product. One of the rules that professional salespeople live and die for is called the KISS rule. Keep it simple, stupid. Do not try to overcomplicate the process. Do not try to get into too many technical details when it comes down to the equipment or the service that you have to offer. Because that client does not have as much technical knowledge as you who has been immersed into the process for a long time. So it's very, very, very key to make sure that you're keeping it as simple as you possibly can. This, one of the best ways of keeping it simple is the use of analogies. You will notice in the example that when the customer said that they were not comfortable renting their equipment, I referred to their rental water heater they already had in the home. And I used the analogy of having a Corolla and a Bentley in your driveway and only needing insurance on one of them. That made a lot more sense to the customer than me going into boring technical details about the process itself. So make it your mission to keep it as simple, as clear, and as concise as you possibly can, because then and only then will the customer be responsive to your product and your service. In conclusion, I would like to welcome you to the first day of the rest of your life. You have begun a journey that is guaranteed to be rewarding, to be challenging, and to be full of growth. If you don't quit, if you stick with it, if you pledge to learn, if you pledge to put in more time than the next guy, then in no time you'll be making the seven figures that you're after. But remember, anything worth having in life is worth fighting for. So if you're willing to fight, if you're willing to sweat, if you're willing to bleed, you will get there. Not everything is going to click right at the beginning. Not everything is going to be unicorn and rainbows right off the bat. But remember, a diamond is just a piece of coal that's stuck with it. So you choose. Are you going to be a diamond? or are you gonna die as a piece of coal?